the woman would go to a counselor five mm. times before her one man does. And this is true across all. It's um, across the yeah, world. This is across In our society, even more so. Yeah. But much more across the world, everywhere. That's what happens. Also, and this is the spiraling, scary thing. Um, counselors, psychiatrists, health business is now taken over almost completely by women. Mm-hmm. So men are not even willing to go also because there's no other man sitting across to, to them. That is another thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Recognizing those parts in yourself that are in the shadow because of whatever trauma you went through, yeah. as you talk about, you know, you don't just, you're not just born that way, you become yeah. that way. What led to that, having compassion for that, and really compassionately accepting that side of you. Yeah. It may never change. Yeah. Sometimes it changes. Sometimes it just doesn't. And okay, I think you don't need to defeat your monster. You just need yeah. to witness it. I always like to have my toothpaste pushed from the bottom up. Okay. And she'd be like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right. It's so usually weird. the opposite. But I know, okay. it's, like, it's a weird habit of hers. <laughs> like, oh, you know what, fine. It's all right. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Iram Said podcast series. So my guest today needs no introduction. He is a very, very well-known actor, one somebody that I was actually already a fan of, although I don't usually watch dramas as I usually say, but Umair Rana's dramas always interest me and we'll talk about why and some other very interesting things as we uh, begin our conversation with Umair. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Welcome. Th- thank you for having me here. It, I know you are on a tight schedule and it, was, it means so much to me that you said yes because I have been... The reason for starting this podcast really was to have candid conversations, especially the conversations that are perhaps not being had mm. at the moment. So we're going to talk about some of those things, but I want to mention here that... Um, I've been a fan of your work because um, as an actor, I feel, um, you know, because I've also had a lot of interest in studying human behavior, being a you know, motivational speaker that goes with the territory. Characters that you play, um, they, they seem so real. Like, you know, as, as a motivational uh, the speaker who is very familiar with human behavior, I look for those things in dramas or mm. movies or whatever, right? Mm. And it seems when you're dealing with a Hollywood movie, for example, the characters are very well researched and, mm. and you can believe that this person is this way. But in Pakistani dramas, unfortunately, um, a lot is left to be desired, but not in your characters. Um, when you are playing the villain when, or when you're playing a very narcissistic husband, it's just all so real. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about that a little bit. How much work do you put into that? Do you study such characters? Uh, I'm really glad that you brought that up uh, because uh, un- unfortunately in this era of fast food and home delivery, uh, we really don't, many of us don't end up work putting in the effort that was is due. Yeah. Let's just put it to which is due. Um, I, I I would like to attribute this as a fortune for I have had to go through the mill of theater for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd also like to attribute this to lots of my students, who, some of them who happen to be right across your building when it, there used to be a building, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, was to teach them drama. So when we talk about all these various things, including char- character, you know, characterization, creating a character, and acting out a character, improvisation, so there'd be certain things that we'd always be talking about. Mm-hmm. So when, you, when, for example, when you'd be doing theater, we'd be getting to a character, this time error in this person, you have to embody the person. So the, I mean, as, as good teachers would always say, the great... A good good piece of acting is not acting; it's just being. Mm-hmm. So when you have to become someone, mm. um, you can't do that purely b- by the mechanics which we get to see. Mm. That's the unfortunate part. So mm. with the fast food quick fixes, just do the mechanics. Yeah. Um, you know, just do the imitations, just do whatever mockery or characterization that you do. Or just say the lines. Just say the lines, and if you're a villain, <laughs> you know, twiddle your wish those ha ha ha. You know, so it's it's, it's all that. Mm-hmm. But but as you said, the the hope and the attempt is to keep it as real and natural as it is. Mm. Um, we mustn't create extremes so that people don't empathize with them. I, I want people to empathize with the villain as well. Yeah. They need to I empathize. did. I empathized with that narcissistic person. They need to do that. Person. They need to understand, yeah. oh, I can see this happen. Yeah. And more so, 
and I hope we'll be talking about it today later as well, why does that happen? Mm. Why does that person end up doing what they do? Yeah. And we keep talking about separating the actor and the action, mm. but that action has stemmed from the actors. It has stemmed from a story of this person where they have been brought to this point. Why? So one has to understand that. Um, I have had that pleasure, and I think um, slow and steady, I uh, seem to dive into psychology and psychotherapy and all that behavioral sciences, uh, and again, to the quest of how the human brain works and yeah. why do people it's behave the way they do, it is fascinating. It is. And, and, and with the background of theater and the, and the pleasure of this and getting the opportunities, whatever you do, for me as an actor, that's a golden opportunity. Yeah. So for me to try and say, all right, how do I justify this person, right? Yeah. How, do, how do I justify how yeah. this person ends up doing what they do? So I do do my own research at their own stage. I mean, I think the extreme most that I ever did in the psychotic guy I would never want to encourage anyone to be. I actually sat down with my psychiatrist friends. Yeah. I said, I can't justify this. I, yeah. This is a massive roadblock. This is, this is the Gaza wall. I can't cross this. Mm. How, do I, how do I justify this guy putting this woman through this hell because she resembled his mother? And then Freud and then Jung yeah. and then everything came out. And it's like, all right. And the fact that he cannot feel that emotion yeah. beyond the nose it's like ah okay so it, it, it was scary it is very very difficult um as as you mentioned it is fascinating human behavior fascinates me as well and it's interesting you used it in acting i used it in actually helping people get mm. you know move from dysfunctional behaviors to functional and part of what i do in my courses is to help them to really see those what we call the shadows yeah. that you really don't want to see. Yeah. And the more you suppress it, the more powerful it actually becomes yeah. and you just don't realize it. Yeah. Like you said, you can't see beyond your nose what those emotions are. And I have a little bit of background in psychology and that I took pre-medical and I had to study psychology. But since then, my interest in human behavior has been just, mm. you know, continuous. And, and you're in a way what you're saying is so important because you know it doesn't help for a normal person to think that either people are evil or they're all good yeah. because most of us are in between the grays but Nobody's we but we do tend to think that way i think we do we, we love to we simplify do. it for our own sanity yeah. so we always look at stories not alone just on television but generally in life mm -hmm. there has to be a good guy and a bad guy and we always like to paint it. Thanks to social media, it's, it's caught fire <laughs> like yeah. crazy. So the moment we hear or see something, we want to immediately label, we're in this camp against that. Yeah. Or we're, we're, we, this person's a horrible person. Yeah. You know, um, And take things out of context and twist it to justify on ourselves. Yeah. But I'm glad exactly what you said, is, and that's, that's a pursuit. Everyone's gray. Yeah. Everyone's gray. I love that old saying. That like the only normal person in this world is the person you haven't met yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone's abnormal. Yeah. We are. All of us are. There's I know. some level of dysfunction in everybody. All of us. And, and we need to be more aware of it. We need to be aware for our own selves. Uh, and I think that's the only way we can play our role. I mean, you can do it in terms of exactly what you're doing. And I can do it in terms of because showing the people that this person is a, a, a regular human being doing something irregular things. And this is a very important point, Omer, because what it seems to me, because I've been now in Pakistan three years, it seems to me that the drama industry, the entertainment industry is not realizing the responsibility that they have. They are shaping the thinking of a whole generation and maybe even further. Yeah. Yeah, right? uh, yeah, it's absolutely true. And, and that's unfortunate. But I, I would, um, I mean, there's so many factors we can talk about that. But I would attribute above all to capitalism. Mm. Um, it is pure money, profit matter. Mm. And it's not even formula, formula mm, yeah. pure and simple. Mm -hmm. This is the data I'm getting. I'm not even going to question the data. If everyone over here colludes and agrees that this is the data we're getting, people want this kind of content mm -hmm. from the sponsors to the producers yes. to the broadcasters, then that's what I'm going to just keep regurgitating and you know, putting this wine in a new bottle and then sell it again. Um, and unfortunately, it is not the entrepreneurial capitalism. Yeah. It is a trader mindset capitalism, mm. which is the worst kind yes. of capitalism you can Agreed. get. So it's nothing of a vision of a long longevity of a business, which I think one should aspire towards. That is, that is the good side of the capitalism that I can yes. perhaps encourage. So you want to put a man on the moon kind of situation, yeah, right? Entrepreneurship with a vision. It's entrepreneurship yeah. with a vision. But with a trader, it's like I wake up today. Yeah. I 
buy this for X, I sell yeah. it for X plus N, mm -hmm. and it's my profit, I go to sleep, I'll repeat this every day. Yeah. That is only going to keep you regurgitating. There's no as risk an, taking that. As an actor, do you feel that there is a sense of responsibility in what kind of roles Absolute, you accept and what kind I, of absolutely. message you're giving out? Absolutely. I think um, the school of thought that I belong to and keep trying to hold on to those sets of values is, um, it, it's, and now I understand it's deeply entrenched in, in Lahore and our old city and various other countries and cities as well. Um, and, and when they say that, I remember going to Varis Nihari at one night mm -hmm. in Lahore. It's my favorite mm -hmm. Nihari hangout. And it I'm, is very good. I, and it's, it's amazing. And I met uh, the, the gentleman a couple of years ago and I said, you know, I've been hopping on Nihari everywhere. Mm -hmm. In Lahore, in Karachi, in New York, in Delhi, everywhere I go, Dubai, I have Nihari. Mm -hmm. And in Lahore, this is by far the best and I've been having it since 1991, <laughs> since I moved to Lahore. And I was like, why is that? And he said that old wisdom, mm -hmm. he said, <laughs> he said, Ibadat samaj ke kari Beautiful. So when you consider wherever you're going to be making your bread mm -hmm. as a and place of Ibadat. worship, yes. As place where you serve mankind, yes. as where you do the duty for the Great Almighty, obviously you you're you're honor bound to do it properly. Yeah. So it, it's something that we, I need to keep reminding myself yes. that hey, uh, whatever I'm doing, there's a there's a great matter of power, and and again I go back to theater where the Greek could not even allow women to be passive audience members in a theater hall. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of power we have because obviously if you keep women away from something, it must be powerful, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so that's the kind of power authority we have. We have to keep reminding ourselves. And yeah. I have tried as much as I can. I'm from minor, major to crazy scale. I remember there's this one play, uh, the director said what the script says. He, he calls his wife, he's abroad, and he says, um, you've really hurt my son to the point that he's irreversibly damaged. I do not want to be married to you again. Talak, talak, talak. I said, I can't do that. Mm. So what do you mean? I was like, that last part I can't do. Mm. Because that's for me reinforcing a wrong message to the audience that if you just say talaq three times, it's talaq. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. That's a responsibility we have. It's far from reality, Islam. It's, it's not it doesn't the sharia. Allow it. yeah. Exactly. It's not sharia. So I don't want to reinforce something which, yeah. is, which is something I vehemently believe is wrong. Yeah. So we try to do those things. That's really uh, good. To whatever, whatever extent we can. Yeah, because the level of, I would say, ignorance... Uh, regarding Islam is astounding and I didn't realize it until I moved here which is why I started making these videos never thinking that they would go viral and actually I, I, I joke about this because I had put on not 20 but 30 pounds uh, COVID weight and so when I started making these videos because I just couldn't keep myself from speaking out right because mm. I was seeing all this and the, mm. and mm. the kind of slogans they had and having lived in the U.S. Mm. and seen uh, what damage mm. uh, the movement had done, lots of benefits too, yeah, of course. but also the toxic side of that feminist movement mm. and the damage mm. it had done. And now I was seeing it happen in Pakistan, so I had to speak out. And it's funny, I used to pray to God, because I look so bad, I've gained so much weight. <laughs> and then, of course, it went viral and everybody's like, oh my God, what happened to you? Mm. But, you know, the level of um, unawareness, ignorance, because everybody likes to talk about Islam. Everybody's an expert on Islam. But I was shocked to see how little they actually know about the real Islam. My, my area of focus... Um, has been emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I spent a lot of my time and money in the U.S. learning and then eventually seeing that actually the best curriculum of emotional intelligence is in Islam, mm -hmm. in especially the life of the Sira, you know, mm -hmm. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, most excellent example of, of emotional intelligence. So <clears throat> let's talk about that a little bit because we were discussing before we, um, before the shoot that the emotional intelligence that is required to maintain happy relationships, yeah. it is at an appallingly <laughs> alarming low. Yes. Right? So yes. how so that we have very low emotional intelligence, add to that this factor that humanity has never been through a situation that we're going through now. Mm -hmm. Social media, yeah. Tinder, Minder, yeah. you know, all those dating apps, Bumble. Um, the level of interaction people have, the the, the ease of of going after outside of your marriage yep. and and you know 
the level of acceptability that I have seen in Pakistan mm -hmm. for extramarital affairs does not exist in the U.S. as you probably know you go there often enough. So talk about that a little bit that we are a society of emotionally unintelligent people yeah. and yet we are crying about the rising divorce rate and we're blaming it on so many other things. Yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. I, I mean uh, taking just one of those elements uh, the three levels that I like to break things down to. This is the era of information. Mm -hmm. But information is the bottom line of everything mm. um, from which you will have to then filter what information mm -hmm. is a cred credible which is not yes, you know, there's exactly. a lot of misinformation what is useful what is not yeah and, and yeah. there's new terms coming up to define the variations that there's misinformation there's disinformation you know yes. alternate truth <laughs> as people would call it yeah but let's say you've figured out what the actual credible information plausible information is but then that you have to turn that information into knowledge that's mm. the higher grade of it mm. and I've seen some from my generation previous rather, um, great knowledgeable people as well. But there are very few that I have then come across who are truly what I would call wise. Mm. And borrowing from my great mentor friend and colleague, Sayyid Fakhar is in Shah Fakhar, but he would say, wisdom really is applying knowledge to your own self. Yeah, it's the application. It's the application yeah. of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we have barely gone on step one. Mm. Now, yes. we're struggling with step one, mm -hmm. let alone step three, mm -hmm. where wisdom would have been. And if you, if you do for a moment go to the wisdom, you'll realize all wisdom would have said, look inward. Yes. All wisdom, yes. every time, Everywhere. every era, every no place, which school, which school what religion, language, yes. they've all said, look inwards. Yeah, look inwards. And we don't have the time to look mm. inwards now. Boredom is a cuss word now. I mean, how dare someone be bored? I, I borrow... So Desmond Morris's um, words, he talks about, he, he's an anthropologist, was an anthropologist who looked at human beings as an animal and called the society as a human zoo rather than an urban jungle because of the behaviors we would do in this place. He said it's a matter of simulation. And mm. we're talking about 70s and 80s. Mm. And I'm thinking of like 2023. Mm. We're a highly overstimulated society now. Yeah. This species yeah. is now on a massive steroidal overdrive yes. of stimulation. Yes. There is no moment where everyone, anyone can sit idle yeah. and not take their phone out. Yeah, Just be with yourself. No one's doing that. Yeah. And it's so difficult for anyone to do it. Even I have to resist. I have to mm -hmm. consciously resist yes. doing that. I understand. You I know, do that too. We all have to try and do that. So it means, A, we are not even getting the right information, let alone wanting to get the information. And B, we're not giving ourselves the ourselves that time. Mm. As long as we struggle with this, we will definitely struggle with our emotional intelligences, amongst other things. Yes. And I have a feeling, unfortunately, uh, if you look at the third element, which is a societal element, men suffer more, in my opinion, than women. Let's talk about that, because that's that subject that, that yeah. not many people talk about, not especially on this platform, which everybody keeps tagging, oh, she's just a proponent for women's rights, which I am. I want to help empower, especially Muslim women. But I've also routinely spoken, uh, spoken on men's rights and the abuse that men go through. Yeah. So let's, uh, you know, let's we, dive in. We, we were talking offline about Pinjra, the play yeah. that I did. And... Um, Again, it's, it sort of wraps up everything that I was talking about earlier, and it's been, again, very close to my heart. Um, when you talk about why anyone, say, Sarwar, my character, does something in Pyar Ke Sat Ke, how would, no one's born a Sarwar. I kept saying to everyone, no one's born a Sarwar. Yeah, we become, make Sarwars. Yeah, exactly. So what must have Sarwar gone through? And I had a backstory to it to justify completely, and his father, his mother, and we created more scenes between him and his mother, played by Gulirana, brilliantly done. Yeah, brilliant. Of how that conflict would, that love-hate relationship, the Oedipus element would kick in, all that stuff. Um, and that viciousness would come through. But I always tell everyone that it pegs down to parenting. It, it really comes down to parenting. Now, let's take that for a moment. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, I mean, we've, we talked about, all right, shadi ho rahi hai, all right, jora kaan se banane. Yeah. So there's a research of that. There's a research in jubilee. Mm -hmm. There's a research on khane ke dishes. Bilkul. There's a research on the Event venues. Event planner and choreographer everything. and everything. We've got everything lined up, right? Even to the point, achha beta shadi is tarah nibhani hai. Now the conversation is slightly happening, how to maintain that relationship. But it's not an open, candid conversation. Still doesn't happen mm. about what marriage is all about. But parents ko bhi to pata nahi hai. That's the point. So <laughs> they don't know. When the parents are so uncertain, Mm -hmm. 
I think the best way forward is say, listen, I'm not 100% certain. Mm -hmm. But I wish someone had this conversation with me. Mm -hmm. Let's have that conversation with each other because you're an adult now. That's yeah. why you're getting married. Yeah. So I'm going to learn maybe from these questions that neither of us have the answers to. Mm -hmm. But let's learn it together. Mm -hmm. No one's willing to come out of that comfort to help the next generation be prepared for marriage. But I think for way below that is the most important thing is parenting. Who talks about parenting? No one does. No one has sat down and said, Now let me let's have a conversation about parenting. Mm -hmm. Whether you think you're ready to be a parent or not. Mm -hmm. What does parenting mean? What does parenting entail? What are the true challenges of parenting? No one has that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to happen. And, it does. And unfortunately, men of all people don't have that conversation at all. It's too uncomfortable. It's too uneasy. They don't know. And when we did Pinjara, I again leapt at it was because it was about the challenges of parenting in these catastrophic times of today mm -hmm. with the same said you know IT moments and ICT situations the social media situations and whatnot the stresses that kids go through the drug epidemic that our kids are now going in through schools which is criminal what we're doing with them I agree and you know when it comes to parenting another thing that um, I feel that really needs to happen is um, you know, parents are more about what does the society expect of me so that I can get validation for being a good parent, yeah. which is usually putting a lot of pressure on our kids to get certain types of grades, to yep. get into certain types of schools and colleges, and then marry a certain type of person, yeah. and then um, at least keep the facade of a good marriage yep. in front of the society. Yep. So our values as parents have been really messed up. Yep. And that's what we're passing on to our children. I, I was in a, um, in a conference and uh, the gentleman on the stage, you know, he was the president and he came on stage and he said, we are the mother of our children who said that our children are going to be married. So there are still a lot of people that believe in well, that. They would say it in a conference? That's pretty interesting. Well, I, if I told you, I'll tell you afterwards where, yeah, yeah, yeah. you would be shocked. It, and it was on the celebration of Women's Day, by the way. So, so, so he, he's a very, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's a really good guy, a father. I'm sure. He thought this advice was actually really good. Yes, coming from a good place, he's trying to he's, do Yes, it coming from a good name. place yeah, because okay, he's fine. thinking divorce rate is so high. This is, this is one of the reasons why. So we need to retrain our girls to basically put up and shut up uh, and then die. Yeah, yeah. So... I obviously could not keep my mouth shut, so when I went on stage, I, I said something about it. But I, I understood that it's not that he's a bad guy. And you know, you were talking about labels. It's like I am. I I really hold that back. I actually, it's one of my pet peeves putting just a label on someone. You're a misogynist. Mm. It could be coming from a misogynistic point of view or mindset. Doesn't necessarily mean the guy is a misogynist. He just doesn't know any better. So. And when you do that label, you've essentially boxed him. Yes. You're not giving him the person. opportunity. Narcissism is a big, you know, yeah. word, buzzword exactly. right now. Everybody's like, oh, so-and-so is a narcissist. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and we don't realize that a lot of times <laughs> when we keep finding narcissists around us, there's some narcissism in us. Because we're, we're, we're always yes, of course. looking into the a reflection. mirror, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you see too much narcissism around you, go look yeah. in the mirror. And... Um, Talk to me a little bit more about some of the issues that, you know, because I have these wonderful gentlemen um, on my team. They're all good guys, but the, but they're very scared, I feel, in, mm. in today's society because they want to be good guys. Mm. The boundaries are not very clear about what is a good guy and what is, you know, who is not a good guy. They just, they're terrified of being labeled as misogynistic because mm. women are just doling that out, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about that because I know there's a lot of pain in good men mm. around this subject. That's true. I, mean, I think the fact that we're having this conversation mm -hmm. is automatically, possibly, inviting trouble already and, Could and, be. and, and I, that, get a, I get a lot of backlash on oh, my no. platform so and it's that, okay and that essentially is the first diagnosis of the problem mm -hmm. um, when you talk about men does not mean that you're talking about against women on yeah. the contrary I yeah. personally believe that we need to prepare our men 
for the women yeah. and for the daughters, essentially saying, hey, you have a son and a daughter. Who do you wish good for? Mm-hmm. You're not going to say, uh, not for the son, I, I wish for the daughter. We wish good for both. Yes. And that's what true societal uplift is. And for me, that's true feminism as well. Yeah. So it's, it's a humanity before everything yes. else. And that should be the fair thing. Now, when men feel scared, they're essentially feeling scared for what? That we may feel as if we're following the line, we're towing mm-hmm. the right line, mm-hmm. and we're going to be called on it, and we're going to be lynched. Now, th- th- there are two questions to that. One, what is the line? Who drew that line? Yeah. If they're following it, assuming they are, then wh- where did the line come from? Yeah. And it cannot be driv- written or drawn or sketched only by men. Yeah. This line is drawn by society, which includes women, yeah. which includes mothers, which includes sisters, which includes girlfriends or stranger women or bosses, whoever they are, yeah. all contribute to that line. Yes. Now, and secondly, let's assume that line was the perfect line, which doesn't exist and never will. But let's say there's a right line and they have stepped out for a moment and they get lynched. Mm. So what we're saying is that now, nah, even one mistake is, is unforgivable. Is unforgivable. Yeah. And I think that is inhuman because yes. by definition to err is to be human, yeah. right? And it is what God has always asked by as Rahman or Rahim, we keep saying every day, every time we're supposed to, is that try to take this attribution or at least aspire to that attribution to forgive is divine. Mm-hmm. And now I'm not saying that you forgive the most brutal things. I'm talking about the everyday small little things that you have to, and again, as you very rightly said, educate. Give them that education. Give them that knowledge. People don't know. If in if you know Imam Hassan and Hussain's children are teaching someone how to do their wudu properly, mm. so it means anyone can teach anyone yes. at any time in the right, respectful manner. And this, for me, the last part is the most important thing. Respect. So when I said that, if you've got uh, you've got the right spirit of feminism, for me, is hum- humanism, mm-hmm. and I mean that because that means that both have to be given that kind of due respect. Mm-hmm. Respect is the ultimate thing. Everyone is significant. Mm -hmm. Grant them that significance. They are important. Mm -hmm. The moment you'd say, no, this person is more important than the other, you've automatically said, you're insignificant. But try to bring both of them with equal significance. That's important. Now, bringing back to, say, for example, the Pinjara factor, everyone is talking about how to raise children well, single women have harsh responsibilities of life in society but we can open up to them women who go out to work and feed their children honorably we should respect them we, we were aiming for all that and I'm glad we checked all those boxes however um, what no one talked about and I'm coming from a very personal space because that character is someone I owned Javed the father uh, no one said why did Javed behave the way he did hmm. Why? how was he justified in being so harsh and cruel with his son or why he was being so myopic by keeping his daughter in a typical controlled role. Mm. Why was he not allowing his wife to freely be herself, the actualization of being the guitarist and the musician and the whatever. Why was he doing that? Mm. This is a conversation our society has to have. Because this boy has come from somewhere. This man, Javed, was a boy. Mm. He was raised by society. He was told, as you very rightly said, compete, compete, compete. Be the number one, be outstanding in your class, in your college, in your school, in university. Get the right job. Make the money. Be the breadwinner, the old traditional role of a father, which is now a question we all have to ask. Are we going to be held accountable to the same old role? Mm -hmm. Because the times have changed, you know. The women have changed. The situation has changed. We need both incomes coming in. Some cases, women can bring in more income. Um, Man has a different role as a father now as what was the traditional role. Mm -hmm. Uh, And unfortunately, in this particular note, I have a feeling we've given the girl, our girls a good new script. But the boys have no script. Yeah. So these boys who are feeling scared is because I don't know the line anymore. Mm-hmm. The line is gone. <laughs> but give me a new line and I'll walk it. I'll walk I will it. learn it. So we have lost that script. Yeah. And we have, thirdly, the role models are not coming. Mm-hmm. So if the father does not know what his job is, mm-hmm. and he feels that my job, and I'm saying this again very personally, there was a moment that I balled up crawled up into a ball on the floor and wept Mm. because the income situation became so bad. Mm. And my children were knocking on the locked door outside and I constantly felt I failed them. Mm. Because I realized in that moment, now in reflection, that I had ascribed to the same role as a father. Mm. As long as I'm the primary provider at least, if not the provider, but the primary provider, and I'd failed to do that, my reason of existence doesn't Mm. justify. Mm -hmm. We need to change that. The, the fathers today are feeling the same pressure and their sons are watching them. 
and monkey see monkey do mm. so if they're going to see this is how they behave and this is the role of the man they're going to try and emulate it in a very different so environment do you think the role should be changed absolutely the role has changed and i think the significance of say in this case the father is not the father's important because he does this the father's important period mm. just like i'd say the mother's important period mm. so i would say the same thing for the father it mustn't be conditional just like the love for a child mustn't be conditional because and it comes to the complete loop in our society i've often said this which is quasi blasphemous that i said sometimes i say in some cases in some manners we should raise our sons the way we raise our children our daughters mm. because and what is that traditional thing that i'm alluring to daughters are raised that tumne padhai ghar ka hona hai so they taught with skills and values you know and all care and affection sabar sabar the given all those things and then they have, they know that there's an expiry to this love that we give to her so we have to give her this love and then they give her this love and she goes away mm-hmm. the sons directly verb- verbatim many times and sometimes softly indirectly mm-hmm. the boys are being told ke tumne hamare budhape ka sahara banna hai you have to take care of us you are our retirement plan mm-hmm. so essentially everything that i give to you has mm-hmm. a condition yeah. that you have to give it back to me with interest later on mm-hmm. you're going to take care of me when you give love unconditionally you get a daughter who will come back to you when you're yes. unwell yeah and the son who you give love conditionally lives with you but he's not there to attend to you mm-hmm. which has been a very traditional normal sense that's so true i had and, never thought of it this and way and that's essentially what's happening mm-hmm. so the son always has felt that i'm a recipient of a conditional love mm-hmm. so when he gets married to a woman i have to provide to this woman because that's my condition when he has children i have to provide to this children because mm-hmm. that's my condition imagine the misery of that man mm-hmm. who feels that if i do not do that my entire existence of love is just unjustified that is profound i had never thought of it this way so this is the troubles that our men are going through and they feel as if if i'm providing you need to take care of home camp and i'm taking care of this and if it doesn't happen they say you know what i'm going to take charge and they take charge coldly mm. because another tragedy that is happening to our society men are not allowed to be vulnerable oh my god yes they're not allowed not. even amongst friends mm-hmm. the boys when they get they together to stoic and yeah completely stoic and they're having these stupid lewd kind of conversations as a match of i don't know weird kind of bonding that men do mm-hmm. and i'm as a man i'm testifying it's it it's dysfunctional it's yeah but codependent it, it is but the true true dependent codependent functionality uh, essentially is good friendship yeah. which aristotle and all the wisdoms would tell you and what is true friendship is mutual vulnerable vulnerability yeah that i'm going to be vulnerable towards you and you're going to be vulnerable towards me and it's going to be okay and i'm going to respect that that's one of the highest orders of relationship irrespective of gender i agree men don't get that men again why because we've been drummed in you show your weakness and i'm saying this exactly what i was told never let your wife know your weakness yeah I was told this as yeah. as a wisdom for a guy and I was like all right this is a and this is vulnerability is considered weakness is weakness so this is Although my male mentor strength. and he's yeah. saying this to me must be true unless and you know but satte khaye baad mein dekha what the hell was that that was insane yeah it doesn't make sense so because vulnerability you mer you know I teach about relationships also and there are three golden rules that my mentor taught me for any kind of relationship especially a romantic relationship marriage and we call it ATV and that's authenticity transparency 100% transparency and vulnerability the ability for someone to be vulnerable in front of someone is first of all it takes courage yeah. so weak people can't do it and second the kind of trust because yeah. it immediately brings you close to that person mm-hmm. and it is seriously lacking in marriages yeah. so after a while we begin to drift apart and yeah. you know we just go our different ways because vulnerability is that key uh, is that samad bond or that glue that actually bonds people together and it actually creates interestingly attraction yeah. long term attraction yeah. and love real Absolutely. love because the true love yeah true love because you know i don't have to pretend 
that I'm this perfect person. Maybe I have to pretend to a certain degree in front of the world, mm -hmm. but there should be someone that I can be completely naked with, not physically, but emotionally and spiritually. They should know every side of me, the shadows, yeah. the parts that I don't want to see. Yeah. They should be able to see all that. And when, when I am accepted in that way, that is love. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise we know, we're not showing this person parts of ourselves. We know in our hearts that I'm actually not loved. They are yeah. loving a version of me yeah, that I'm yeah. willing to show them. And that's how we have our friendships. That's how we are with our children. That's how we are with our spouses. And, you know, I, I really like what you said. Thank you so much for bringing that into my awareness because I wasn't aware that the, the conditional love that a boy feels growing up from his parents, that's, that's really true. Because being a girl, of course, I never, um, never would have thought that. And then you also mentioned um, that we need to change this expectation of a man being the breadwinner because I have believed that that's how it should be. But as you were talking, I was reminded because I, of course, say that Rasulullah Sallam is the best example yeah. of yeah. emotional intelligence. Well, we see in his in his example that Hazrat Khatija yeah. was far wealthier and he worked for her. So therefore, he was not necessarily the primary breadwinner, although yeah. later on with his wife, of course he was. that changed. But um, so those are definitely things that we need to have more conversations on and yeah. maybe bring both people, both sides to the table and discuss. Yeah. Because if, if, the, 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 the parties are emotionally aware yeah. and what you called wisdom and they have this authenticity and vulnerability, you can overcome anything. Mm. Absolutely. In today's very scary day and, yeah, day and age, which is, which is very difficult for rela long-term relationships are going to go further yeah, no down. Slide. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I appreciate what you said, the ATV. I'm trying to remember this now. <laughs> but, but And it's true because, and again, I think I like the fact that you saved vulnerability for there because I think vulnerability encompasses all of them. Yeah. You cannot be your true self when you yeah. know you've got these quirks. Yes. You know, you're weird in some way. Yeah. You cannot be your true self unless you're willing to be vulnerable. Yeah. You can never be transparent mm -hmm. unless you're willing to be vulnerable. Exactly. It's putting yourself out there. Yeah. And it is weird. It and is it's uncomfortable. scary. It is scary. <laughs> it is. And, and again, again, from the men's point of view, the scariness, the fear is, um, uh, I'll be exploited mm -hmm. because I've been, I have been exploited and I've witnessed of the being or I'll exploited. I'll be vilified. I'll be vilified. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be like, all right, ousted. I'll be ostracized mm -hmm. or I'll be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. You cannot put your guard down. Mm -hmm. A man has to keep their guard up. That unfortunately has to be addressed. And again, I'm not saying you put out the, the worst sin of your life in front of someone for the first time you meet them. No. <laughs> it's a baby steps. You, you take out a right, I'm weird this way. You know, yeah. it's quirky stuff. I remember couples who have this conversation, and I still remember that, um, my wife and I still do, <laughs> that I always like to have my toothpaste pushed from the bottom up. Okay. And she'd be like... Tch. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right. It's so usually weird. the opposite. But I know, okay. it's, like, it's a weird habit of hers. Like, oh, you know what, fine. It's all right. Yeah. Because um, a very wise man, uh, late Major General Kamal Dubani, my brother's ex father in law, he, he once said to me, <laughs> We're sitting here as a man of very few words. We're sitting in front of the TV, and all of a sudden he's like, Man, yes. what's love? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a young boy. I was like, oh, I put on I, like, oh, I don't know. He's like, no, what is love? Try it something. I was like, I don't know. People have written pains and songs yeah. and movies and books about it. I don't know. And he said, he said, love is truly accepting someone knowing their flaws. Yes. And that stuck with me. And I kept trying to wrestle what does that mean? And obviously with time, the application of that knowledge has turned into that wisdom. Mm -hmm. It is only once you're vulnerable with me mm -hmm. and I can see the true weaknesses and ills that, I, that you identify. And I genuinely accept you. Yeah. Not, you know, romantically, but genuinely accept you. Yeah. Knowing those flaws, that yes. is true love. That is true love. That is true love. And, and it, it actually begins with one's own self. Knowing, Abs you know, your weaknesses. I'm so you glad you said that because that has been my recent lear learning. Yeah. So my little daughter, Afia, she was what, five maybe or four? And she said, um, uh, so Baba, who do you love? I was like, Jani, I love you. Uh -huh. uh, who else do you love? I was like, I love Bhai. Who else do you love? I love Amma. Like, who else? It's like, Dadi. Who else? And I'm looking around. Who else wow. is around here? I was like, Kylo, the cat? I was like, who? No, Baba, who? Who? Come on. She was waiting for the right answer. Like, I don't know who. 
yourself, Baba. Wow. And I was like, yeah, He's ne- a wise I've one. never thought of this. And and putting these two lessons together, I realized yeah. I always have been very harsh with myself. So it means I know my flaws. You're not even on the list. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even my own list. Yeah. But if I know my flaws, I should accept myself knowing those flaws. Yeah. And she's right. I should love myself. And I don't mean, you know, I am amazing as cost to someone else. No, but I genuinely think I'm not bad. You know, so you don't have to vilify your own self because we've become so self-critical sometimes. Yes. The opposite end of the spectrum of narcissism, yeah. right? The opposite end. So I was like, oh, all right, hold on. We have to find that median. And I, for me, the median is love. The median is love. The, the opposite is apathy. Mm. It doesn't matter. So, so I, I realized, yeah, that's, that's what we need to do. And men don't do that because men don't look inward. Men are not willing well, to... Well, women don't either. I, in my courses that, you know, we've had... a. Alhamdulillah, about a thousand people go through my 30 Days to Transformation course, which, you know, I take them from wherever they are to transformation. And some men have do it too, done it too, but mo- mostly it's women. And um, invariably, majority of women that come into the course, it's either because they've caught their husband cheating or they got went through a divorce or something. And it's always about, you know, outward judgment that mm. he did this to me and he did that to me. And... So I always tell them right in the beginning, this course, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to fix your husband. Nobody mm. can do that. You mm. can't do that. I can't do that. The only person you can fix is yourself. And mm. we will begin with getting to know yourself. Mm. <clears throat> so by the, by the mid, midway through the course, now that they, you know, we use several tools and techniques, and they get to meet those shadows of their own self that they never wanted to look at, yeah. they go into a lot of you know, like self-judgment then. Yeah that, oh my God, it's, I've been blaming him for all of this stuff, but I did, you know, I did this and this and this. I'm a horrible person, and I always tell them it's not about, now, you know, you had placed the blame on him, now you're shifting it yeah, to, yeah. to yourself. Exactly. It's not about that. It's about recognizing your role that you played, taking responsibility for it, and, and, seeing, uh, recognizing those parts in yourself that are in the shadow because of whatever trauma you went through, yeah. as you talk about, you know, you don't just, you're not just born that way, you become yeah. that way. What led to that, having compassion for that, and really compassionately accepting that side of you. Yeah. It may never change. Yeah. Sometimes it changes, sometimes it just doesn't. And okay, I think you don't need to defeat your monster, you just need yeah. to witness it. You need to witness it. That the monster it. exists. <coughs> Excuse, <coughs> Sorry, yeah. Excuse me, yeah. Just by witnessing it and, and accepting that it's a part of you actually takes the charge it off does. quite a bit. Yeah. It loses power Yeah, the, yeah the bite's gone. Yeah, the bite's gone. Exactly. And then it may show up once in a while. But at least you know okay. where it is. Yeah, instead of being this big, big, huge yeah. elephant, it's a little tiny poodle now. Yeah. But, but let, <laughs> me, let me swing it back again. Yeah. For It seems I'm playing... Of course, it's absolutely right for everyone should do this. But the advocacy for the men situation... Mm-hmm. Um, how many men would come to this course or how many men that I know I would say go to a counselor and they don't they don't the woman would go to a counselor five mm-hmm. times before her one man does and this is true across all it's um, across yeah, the world this is across in our society even more so yeah but much more across the world everywhere that's what happens also and this is the spiraling scary thing um, counselors psychiatrists health business is now taken over almost completely by women Mm-hmm. So men are not even willing to go also because there's no other man sitting across to, to them. That is another thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. So imagine the spiral. Do you think men find it to. easier to open up to a woman or to another man? It, it can be challenging for a woman to open wow. up to a woman. It can be challenging. That is interesting. So it is, it is someone because they will feel, again, it's like the empathy. The, if, I, if I were in America right now, I say I want to talk about my particular issues and I find a Caucasian white female as opposed to a... Pakistani or Asian male. Mm-hmm. I'll say, right, this person will understand my social values as well. Yeah, yeah, so obviously true. that would be my preference, right? So men, men go through the same thing. Also, when you talk about trauma, um, it, it's tragic because people need to understand how the first six years, eight years are the formative years and how they play in your, in your childhood psychology. And again, they're on by post-teen as well. The kind of physical trauma in parenting that a son gets mm. compared to a girl, a daughter, yeah is a huge difference yes. just getting one slap one physical trauma is detrimental mm-hmm. so compare that to what the boys are getting mm-hmm. 
and what the girls are getting. I'm not saying that we should get more to the girls. I'm saying we should just stop. We should just stop. We should just stop. Yeah. But understand why this boy is growing up to become that man. Mm-hmm. That he's going. I'm not saying he's going to repeat that physical abuse. Not necessarily, but he's hardened now. He's holding his emotions and he's more in. More likely now. to. He's more likely to guard his emotion, his child <clears throat> inside. Uh, whenever I've gone through these sessions and conducted it, I've realized I've become a, 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 an emotional archaeologist. Hmm. I'm digging deep digging to see where, and I'm yeah. unraveling and when I get to a guy I was like oh, how am I going to break this wall alright we'll go through it we'll chisel we'll go for the weakest low hanging fruit and the weakest spot and we'll talk about it mm-hmm. but it's very difficult as opposed to a woman who bi- biologically meant as well but otherwise societal as well is relatively more emotionally intelligent mm-hmm. where a guy who's not already handicapped by mm-hmm. science mm-hmm. and then on top of that society has not helped him either <laughs> so we really need to may have a conceited effort on that another aspect the last aspect for me that has been the case again it's the mentoring and the parenting stage right now we're having less and less men in schools mm. so we still had some male teachers who were considered mentors mm. now we have less men in schools teaching mm. and becoming mentors we have more females mm. A guy, a boy still needs that male a mentor, role model, a role yes. model to look mm-hmm. forward to, even in a schooling environment. I totally we don't agree. Get that. I totally agree. So what do, you, what do you propose? What are the solutions to I this? Think, I think we need to have this conversation at men at any given stage. Yeah. You're a father. I'm a father of a 15-year-old. I should have this conversation as well. Um, my, if your son is about to get married, <laughs> have that conversation. Uh, if your child is young and you are a young father or a mother, have a conversation. Yeah. Everyone needs to start having that conversation. And vocationally speaking as well, get into those fields. Encourage your boys to get into health. But in- before you have these conversations, make sure you have educated yourself. Some degree. Yeah. Don't don't yeah, yeah. don't go give them bad advice like no, 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 no. Again, when I when I said it was a conversation, it was never um, I would I, in fact I'd say it's a dialogue. Um, it's, it's a dialogue. It, it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. The children it's, it's are not very well informed too now these oh, yeah, yeah. days. They, they've it's got a not a lesson. It's not a speech. It's not. Yeah. It's not a speech. Uh, it's not a dictation. You have to have the conversation, and you have to go in there. As Anton Levin said, the illiterate of the twenty first century is one who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Yes. Go there with that mindset that you're going to unlearn and relearn. Yeah. As you dialogue with your child, you will have to probably unlearn some of. The things that you believe yeah. to be true, I, you know, I. Absolutely, but I keep thinking about it when Hazrat Ali, mm-hmm. Hazrat Talan, who said, "Do not raise your children like you were raised because they're not of your time." Yes. And I'm thinking of that time, and I'm thinking how much of a generational jump was that time, yeah. and and I'm talking about my own household where Gen X, there's a Gen Z, and now there's a Gen Alpha within one household. So imagine how much rapidly the time has changed for yes, us. Yes. So we need to learn, unlearn and relearn. This is so important and I, I wish people would would read more of, of sayings like that from Hazrat Ali Sira, from Rasulullah Pak Sallam Sira. We just have a few things that we keep repeating and we keep following the, those, mm-hmm. right? It's There is so much wisdom in Hazrat Ali Sira as well. And um, I am reminded every day, Umair, because I raised both of my daughters. They're both very headstrong. Surprise, you know, like, I don't know where they get that from. (laughs) So they're both very headstrong. And I learned early on that I had to co-parent, not necessarily with my exes, which I did do, but co-parent with my children. And I had to say, okay, I am thinking that I'm not going to allow you to drive even if you have a permit at the age of 16 because of this, this, and this. Mm. And then, of course, they would give their counter-arguments and that one I lost because it's like, no, I am going to drive. It's just you being unnecessarily cautious and you're you have some fears in your head and you're just, you know, responding to that and that has nothing to do with reality. And mom... It's your job to deal with your own fears. It's not my job to deal with your fears. You know, so, so. I'm impressed. So, so yeah. You wait till you meet her. <laughs> it's um, it's it's been really liberating for me also. I mean, it's it's liberating for them because, you know, they get to make their own choices and then they do have to face the consequences of of that choice. I make sure of that. Yes. But it's also been liberating for me because, um, you know, it takes away mentally this desire for me to get validation from other people Mm. about being a good mom or not Mm. it's about me and my daughters Mm. and we've had a lot of um, 
what you would call difficult conversations at every yeah. given stage of life, like my you just met my older daughter. She and I have had um, the conversation about how she should, uh, what are the things that she should look for in picking uh, a mate, a mm -hmm. possible mate, because uh, even though I'm very grateful that she still says that, Mom, it will be someone that you do approve of, <laughs> So at least I'll be involved in that process. So far. So far. <laughs> <laughs> but And she comes to me for advice. But I have already um, had that conversation with her a few years ago where, based on what I understood, you know, who is a good man? And first understand yourself. And what do you value in life? What are your values? What do you truly want? Mm. And then based on that, who could possibly be a good mate mm. for you, right? Because mm. you can't define what you want in a in a mate unless you know who you are and what mm. you want for yourself. So alhamdulillah, she's quite clear on that. And it's these kind of conversations because I believe what we're doing now in our society is we're trying to fix marriages, right? So of we're course. trying to change the ending. But... Um, I heard someone say, I forget her name, but instead of trying to change the ending, let's focus on trying to change the beginning. Mm. Choose wisely, mm. you know, educate yourself as a parent first so that you can guide your children, educate them mm. so that they can choose wisely. It's mm. not just about looks, yeah, whatever the dramas are teaching us. And, you know, as I said, if, if, um, all the, it, there's a reason why all fairy tales end at when the prince kisses the princess or they get married. Because if the story had continued, yep. <laughs> so it would be Prince Charming. One side will be Cinderella, one side will be the kids in the middle, and they will be the kids in the middle. And they will be the kids in the middle. That's true. <laughs> you know, so yeah. we, in order for, I mean, this could be the best of term, uh, times or the worst of times, because it could be the best of times, because we are now forced yeah. Things just aren't going to work this way anymore. Yeah, what, our parents' generation was the last generation where that kind of stuff worked. It's, it's, it's lovely you said that. And again, I want to try and bring the men angle in this. Okay, right? sure. If, if Absolutely, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm so glad you said that. Because again, I was, I was looking into marriage and I've been thinking about it, been talking about it. And, and I think the bottom line is the values. Um, you know, you, having said that, it, it, this word pops into my mind. Isn't it so beautiful? What, how we describe this relationship in our language in Urdu, um, that if you're, you, it's the set of values that you hold, you need to know that best. And mm -hmm. therefore you look for those core values in someone else. Yes. And you're going to carry those values further. That is truly, because again, it's, the destination is something you have to stop looking at. It's mm -hmm. a journey you focus on. Yes, it's a journey. And that's why we call it Ham Safar. Yeah. So hum safar. isn't that a beautiful word? It is. It, it is. sort of gives you, encapsulates exactly what you should be looking for. We will get on a journey together. We don't know the destination, yeah. but I will definitely choose you for this journey. You're, you're my travel mate. And, and it has to, again, you're right, look inward that way. And these fixing that happens. The men, again, are being told, get this job, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, doctor, engineer, all that stuff still carries on so that you become more liable to get a good wife. Yeah. And they're often looking for trophy wives. Yeah. Many of them are. Or they find a wife who would be equivalent that way. Again, times have changed. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad women particularly now are choosing. Yeah. I'm so glad. Now, what are they choosing from? They're going to be learning it. But men need to know what it's the case now. The case is, again, the script has changed. They're mm -hmm. not going to choose who has the greatest you know, bank balance mm -hmm. or who has the one perfect dimples when they smile, <laughs> you know, or the perfect yeah. pecs. You know? no, yeah, no, no. They're going to be what they're driving, what they're wearing. They're going to be looking at the values as well. They're going to be looking at, all right, how long can I hopefully. journey? Hopefully. I mean, hopefully. Because a but lot I, of girls I'll are still you choosing those. I'll tell you what the trouble, they those. still do. Yeah. But the trouble is, those are dying out. Yeah. The divorce rate, one of the reasons I've noticed, in my opinion, is, is uh, increasing even in Pakistan, is because they'd rather not go through that journey. Mm. I do not want to go through a journey which is going to be uh, you know, off shelf and then gone. Mm. So we, the longevity is still, time has tested it in every generation. Other than the fact they were forced to remain and they had nothing to go back to, 
the longevity of relationships has always been based on those, which is yeah. the the values that they values. find. So the ideal relationships that even the generation today, like our generation, generations before, have always looked up to is like what a beautiful couple they were. Yeah. Were those couples who always respected each other, had the same set of core Dignity values, and they accepted each yes. other with their flaws wholeheartedly. Yeah. And they went through the entire life, and there wasn't a societal pressure. It wasn't a condition. Nothing at all. So now, and borrowing from what you've said, people are now tending to change and they will have to change their approach to marriage, mm-hmm. then marriage will no longer be the beginning. Mm-hmm. It will be the end. Mm-hmm. Essentially, they will, they will watch, observe. Uh, in the West, they're co-inhabiting, but they will live with this person and see how they operate. Mm-hmm. And in scientifically speaking, it says a year and a half at least, mm-hmm. if not two years. You, you observe the person, how, how they are. As Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, you cannot judge someone unless you've seen them in forms of anger and power, etc. Yeah. So you have to see how they are in those situations to yeah. say, because that's where the values will be tested. Yes. That's essentially that's what's happening. That's exactly what they will explain. And expressed. once that happens, you're like, yeah. ah, okay, this person has risen to my point. Oh, I misjudged. Uh-huh. And then they'll review. And, and therefore, the, the wedding will be a culmination of that decision yeah. rather than a beginning of a risk yes. that l- let's Gamble. see how it, let's see how it goes you yeah. know yeah, let's, let's see how, how it goes, goes. <laughs> you know, let's happen. wish for the best yeah roll the dice that is that is yeah. that is very we, well put. I, think, I think those we will leave for Vegas now so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah roll might as well do that instead of gambling on your life like that yeah. might as well go to Vegas and, yeah. and then you lose maybe less amount of yeah. money yeah. than your whole life this has been such a great conversation, Omer. I, I know we will uh, probably need to do more to delve into this deeper because, as you said, these are conversations that have to be had. And hopefully through our conversation today, it will help some other people get some perspective, you yeah. know, and, and some semblance of... Because it's a work in progress. None yeah. of us right now can claim to have the answer. Of course it's, not. Because times are changing and it's just evolving. And... Um, but... But coming to the table, having these conversations, trying to figure out, helping people understand that healthy conflict resolution, there's a method and methodology to that. And that too is one of the most important parts of a long-term relationship is the couple's ability to resolve conflict, which we didn't even talk about today, but maybe next time. But it's been really, really great. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And inshallah, we'll do another one soon. I look forward to that. Awesome. Thank Thank you.